if I was going to ask you what would happen at the end, we would have all sorts of answers across the board. And, and I imagine some of you have, have pretty specific ideas of what is or isn't going to happen. But I imagine there's a good number of people that are kind of like, you know what, I don't really know. You know, Jesus is going to come back, and that's a, that's a, a second coming of Jesus is a, a pretty specific doctrine in, in the church. But in general, we have a lot of speculation. And so I, I say that to recognize that we can have different interpretations. We can have different viewpoints and still be faithful to Jesus. And so sometimes we get into the end times and we get so speculative that we can't necessarily say this way or that way. But I do want to make sure we're careful that we have understanding an understanding of where the implications of our specific thoughts take us. Because that's really important. In Jesus' day, um, the Jews had this concept that there are two ages. There's the present age and then the age to come. And then in between, there was a, what they called the day of the Lord. And that could be a, 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 a single day. It could be a long time period. It wasn't a, it, there was a lot of interpretation for that. But the Jews believed that the only hope for the present age was for God to intervene. That in order for the present age to have any hope, God would have to come and do something so that they could get to this new age, the future age, the age to come. So Jesus, as the Messiah, would have brought the day of the Lord. The Jews would have affirmed that, that the Messiah was, was bringing the day of the Lord. And so there was speculation of Jesus' day of what is this going to look like. And in Matthew chapter 24, we find that the disciples actually asked Jesus, when will this happen? We pick it up in verse 3 of chapter 24. He tells his, uh, his disciples came to him privately and said, tell us when all this will happen. What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow, it won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this is, the only, is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. So Jesus' first part of his response to when all this will happen, when the end will happen, is to basically say the world's going to be in chaos and turmoil. You know, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be famine. And when you look at what Jesus is saying here, his words could kind of be applied at every point in history. You know, you think of, of today, we hear about earthquakes, we hear about famines, we hear about all those all the time. You can't go a week without some major media news outlet posting about what another country is doing, or North Korea is testing nuclear weapons, or Russia's doing this, or China's doing this. And so we hear these rumors of wars all the time. So part of Jesus' point is saying, this type of stuff is happening now. But he continues, he says, Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world, so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. And so, so there's kind of two parts to this. There's, you will be persecuted, and then there will also be apostasy. Apostasy is, is, is falling away from Jesus or, or, or going against him. And, and to be honest, this, the persecution side of things is a little foreign to us. We may have times we feel oppressed as followers of Jesus. We may have times where we feel, well, this isn't fair because I follow Jesus. But in general, we're not facing the same type of persecution that Jesus is, is articulating here. None of us fear death in an imminent sense of way because I follow Jesus. I, I haven't met anybody in our country that feels that way. We may feel under attack, we may feel threatened, but the persecution that Jesus was talking about was pretty intense here. But he also talked about apostasy of some will fall away. Now we have to take a step back sometimes. When I think of the concept of apostasy, 
I think of somebody making this grandiose decision and statement and rejecting Jesus and going away. But that sometimes happens, but it's probably not the common way it happens. What I've experienced is people drifting away. You know, we make slow, conscious decisions that pull us further and further away from Jesus. And Jesus is saying, at the end, this is going to happen. People are going to drift away. People are going to reject him. And so we find that the troubles that followers of Jesus are going to face are not just external threats. It's not just from some outside group or country or something coming and hurting us. There's also the interior issues, the spiritual issues within our own lives that we have to recognize. So we have to make sure, I mean, if we use a Christian term of keep watch, we have to be constantly vigilant with our spiritual lives. Now, Jesus says that the gospel will be preached throughout all nations. And you could argue that this has actually happened, especially with the the invention of radio. We can cross boundaries, cross uh, national borders in which a, a nation doesn't allow Jesus to be preached in there. Well, they can't stop the radio waves. And so the nation still receives some of the message of Jesus. And, and so however we articulate that, however we try to calculate that, is really speculative at best. But Jesus gives us the promise that those who faithfully follow him can endure. We will be saved if we do endure. And he gives us the grace to do so. Now he continues in verse 15. The day is coming when you will see what Daniel the prophet spoke about. The sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing in the holy place. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. A person out on the deck of a roof must not go down into the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return, even to get a coat. How terrible it will be for pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. And pray that your flight will not be in winter or on the Sabbath, for there will be greater anguish than any at at that time since the world began. And it will never be so great again. In fact, unless that time of calamity is shortened, not a single person will survive, but it will be shortened for the sake of God's chosen one. When Jesus is talking, he's saying saying that the end times, the danger that approaches us at those times, says it's going to be something where you've got to act now. You can't wait. Now, there's kind of an underlying concept here that we recognize. We brought nothing into this world, so we take nothing with us. So when the end happens, is it going to matter if you've got your favorite coat on? Is it going to matter if you've got the comfortable shoes on or the shoes that look really nice? It's not going to matter. We, we, we don't take anything with us. Now, Mount, Ma- the Gospel of Matthew, which is where this is from, is not concerned with panic, or, nor is it cowardice. He's not being overly fearful, and he's not trying to rise a panic. What Matthew is, is conveying throughout his Gospel is the call of discipleship, is to act now. We can't wait. If we're following Jesus, it's not, well, let's get our affairs in order, and then we're going to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus, we have to go now. It reminds me of the John Wooden quote, the the UCLA basketball coach, be quick, but don't hurry. And, and, And so Matthew's saying not to panic. If we panic, that would be hurrying. And when we hurry, we tend to make mistakes. We tend to do things that we wouldn't otherwise do. We, we neglect certain things, and, and we just aren't as effective as we are. Or, but we need to be quick. We can't wait. We have to go now and immediately. And continuing in verse 23, Jesus says, Then if anyone tells you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, even if possible, God's chosen ones. See, I have warned you about this ahead of time. This this is one of the most encouraging parts of of the end times to me, is that you're not going to miss it. When Jesus returns, you're not just going to be like, oh, was that it or not? not, We're not going to have a church committee meeting to determine if that actually happened or not. It's going to be clear. Everybody's going to know. You don't have to worry about it. So, so, so you're not going to miss it. So don't panic about that. 
And with this, Jesus is giving us encouragement that we don't need to hide. We don't need to be cowardice. We don't need to run from danger. You know, discouragement's rampant in this world. The trials and difficulties before the return of Jesus may seem overwhelming. But one of the underlying truths that Jesus is telling us is don't panic from the signs. Trust the promise. Trust that things are moving in a way where God wins. That redemption is coming. The difficulties in this life are not just so you have a poor life. It's working towards something. If you remember last week, I talked about the linear view of history. That we believe that there's a starting point and a stopping point to history. Now when I say stopping point, I don't mean a stopping point of our existence. But we have a starting point and we are moving towards the redemption of Jesus Christ. And so we are moving towards that. So we trust the promise. No matter what happens, no matter what comes our way. There's a lot of Just confusion or lack of clarity on what's going to happen at the end. Not because we are unintelligent, but because we don't necessarily know. We don't know what's going to happen when Jesus returns, but we do know it's not going to be hidden. It's going to be public. It's going to be clear. Now, as Jesus is talking, the signs that he gives outside of him actually coming back are something, things that have always happened. There's always been wars and rumors of wars. There's always been strife in the church. There's always been people who have neglected and rejected Jesus. There's always been those types of things. Now, Jesus does say that maybe those things will become more intense right before his return. But how do we actually quantify that? How do we get to a conclusion saying, well, this is what that really means? So we get into some speculation once we leave the words of Jesus, sometimes our imagination takes, a, takes a, us for a ride. And not necessarily in a bad thing, but there are different views on what's actually going to happen in these moments, these end times. There's this concept, this theological concept called premillennial dispensationalism. It really flows off the tongue as far as I'm concerned, but as most theological terms do. But, but it, it's, it's becoming more and more prevalent in our world today. You may not be familiar with that term, but you may be familiar with some of the concepts from it. And, and um, it's, it's, as, I, as I said earlier... We can have different interpretations. We can think the end will happen differently, but there are a few implications and ramifications for following Jesus that we cannot compromise on. But, but the dispensational part of, of this concept argues that the world is, uh, uh, history has been split up into seven different time periods or dispensations. The first one is the is dispensation of innocence, which is Adam and Eve in the garden. And after innocence, we have the concept of consciousness. So consciousness is the second dispensation. The third dispensation is human government, after uh, where uh, uh, humans are trying to rule themselves. And then with Abraham, we get the dispensation of promise. Then with Moses, we get the dispensation of the law. And then after Moses, we have the dispensation of grace, which is because of Jesus. And then the seventh dispensation is that of the kingdom, the coming millennium that we are waiting for. So currently, according to this this viewpoint, we would be in the sixth dispensation. Now, in this this viewpoint, the concept of tribulation arises and becomes a real strong focal point to what they're talking about. Now, tribulation in the book of Revelation is a seven-year period of just difficulties, of turmoil in our world. And there are are various viewpoints of it, but a common one is that halfway through, the Antichrist is revealed. And then at the end of the seven-year period, Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom, his millennial rule for a thousand years. And then after the thousand years are over, you know, they're setting up for a final battle with with humanity and Jesus wins, crushes Satan and establishes the final judgment. You may be, I don't know if you're familiar with any of those types of things yet, but with this, we have the concept of the rapture. And the rapture is 
on some levels, a concept for the church, for followers of Jesus, to avoid the destruction, the tribulation, the periods of difficulties. Now, one thing we have to recognize is this is a relatively new concept. For 90% of the history of Christianity, this concept did not exist. It's a, it's a new theological concept. And, and Matthew, which is where I started from today, is not concerned with the specifics of what will happen. You read the Gospel of Matthew, he is more concerned with indifference, with apathy, than actually the logistics of what are going to happen. So I read from Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 25 has, has some end time type of thoughts where you have the parable of the ten virgins with the lamp and the oil. You have the parable of the, the gold of, of, uh, of using it for Jesus. And you, then you have the parable of the sheep and the goats of, about being ready. So Matthew is more concerned with being ready than actually providing specifics to what is going to happen. Matthew is is challenging us to have constant vigilance. Now, premillennial dispensationalism has a very strong appeal. On some levels, it seems to accommodate modern affairs. We look at the world, we say, man, it's terrible. Things are going bad. Things are getting worse and worse and worse. And, and it looks like it, uh, it's, it's, that's where it's going. And the world is ending up in a mess. But it also has a strong appeal Sounds like a pretty good idea to me when well, Jesus is going to come back and I'm going to avoid all this stuff. I, I, I can avoid all these tribulations, all these bad things. Woo, I get to escape this world. As I said, it's a new theology, newer theology. And it first arises in the 1830s from a guy by the name of John Nelson Darby, who used the term secret rapture in describing the faithful. Then became more popular in 1909 with the publishing of the Schofield Bible. But you're probably most familiar with it, with the authors of Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins in Left Behind. Now, let me pause for a moment. If you've read Left Behind or watched the movies, that's fine. I don't care. I, 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 that made me sound like I was indifferent or arrogant towards it. If, if, uh, I, you know, we, we can engage in those types of things of Christian fiction as a very compelling story that is told, but we have to recognize the context and history of it. And so those are some of the concepts of premillennial dispensationalism, and there are some dangerous things that can come from it. See, each dispensation, every, all the, the periods, had a test for humanity, that humanity failed. Adam and Eve had the test of the apple, or sorry, it wasn't apple, the fruit of the, the, the tree, and they failed, and so they got banished from the garden, and we had this new dispensation, and then humanity failed again. And so we come to all these dispensations. We think the dispensation of the law. God gave Israel through Moses the law. Well, Israel failed, so God had to do another thing, and he brought Jesus. Humanity keeps failing, so God has to keep doing something new. But one of the questions about it is that in Genesis chapter 3, we have the sin of Adam and Eve. We have that described. And God prophesies about Jesus in Genesis chapter 3 when he talks to the snake that, that I will rise up uh, 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 the offspring of the woman to be an enmity between the serpent and humanity. And the serpent will strike the heel, but the offspring will crush the head. Jesus is prophesied right there. So we, have, we skip, why do we have all these other dispensations if Jesus is prophesied in that? Is Jesus meaningful or not? But we have to be careful of any of the end time thoughts because we can have this escapism mentality of we are trying to escape the world. We're trying to get out of here. We're trying to avoid all the difficulties in this life. Now, we, we do want something better. We do long for the newness that God will bring through Jesus Christ. And, and some of this, this rapture theology could come in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It says uh, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are left will rise together with them and meet the Lord, and we will be with the Lord forever. And, and we have this, this mentality. Now, to actually say that's the rapture would be an, an inference at best, but the reality is it's escapism. It's trying to escape this world. I, I, I hope you hear my heart today and that 
we can believe different things for how the end will actually happen. But there are non-negotiables of our faith that we cannot allow ourselves to get to this point. And escapism is one of those things. You know, you read the Gospels. Jesus doesn't talk about escaping. Because Jesus didn't come to escape the world. He came to redeem the world. He came to restore the world. He came to make the world good again. That's what Jesus came to do. Jesus didn't talk about escaping to go to heaven. He talked about bringing heaven here because he was ushering in the kingdom here and now. We're not waiting for it. We're not trying to escape this world. Jesus is trying to do new things here and now, and he calls his church to participate with him in that. So we have to be careful of how we think about end times. We also have to be careful of the ramifications that it can bring. And the church's relationship with Israel is pretty prickly at best. Does God have different promises for the church than Israel? How does that really work? You know, why, does, why do we have in, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, where Peter says, you are a royal priesthood, a chosen people. So how does that work? How does Galatians chapter 6 work when it talks about the Jews and Gentiles are both welcomed together? And I've always wondered that if, if there were separate promises for the church and Israel and how that worked together, why would anyone who's a Jew want to convert to Christianity? Why, why, why would Jesus' disciples who were Jews follow him? Why wouldn't they just say Israel and receive those promises instead? Now, one of the things I do um, in, in my sermon preparation is I try to get several sources that I read to, to give me influence from this. And there are several sources I read that support the concept of premillennial dispensationalism. So if you want to find those sources, you can find them. And if you want to follow them, that, that, that's fine. I'm not trying to say that you are excommunicated from the church in general as a heretic if you believe that. But the reality is I think there are some dangerous conclusions that it com- comes to. And one of the authors that I came across is by a guy by the name of Anthony Hokema, who, who he, he has some other things that I'm not necessarily sure I agree with, but he talks about how, how this, this concept of premillennial dispensationalism can distort the unity of the Bible as a whole. That, um, you know, the Old Testament doesn't teach about this coming millennial kingdom for the... Uh, um, uh, as the New Testament does, that the Bible doesn't talk about the New Testament, or doesn't talk about the millennial kingdom as, a, as restoring the Jews to their land. And those are some things that, that we have to wrestle with if we want to follow this, this line of thinking. But we also have to, have to recognize of the role of the church. Because premillennial dispensationalism talks about the postponement of the kingdom, that we are waiting for it. And what this means is that if we believe that, then it it would bring us to the conclusion that if the Jews had accepted Jesus, he would not have needed to go to the cross. That if they would have succeeded, if they would not have failed in that dispensation, then Jesus would not have been necessary. But they failed, and so, well, we got to deal with the church, so we create the church, and then after the church period is over, the period of grace, then the church goes, goes away, and then we restore the nation of Israel Restore the Jews. And and it becomes a, well, what's the point of the church? The church loses its meaning, loses its value. Oh, well, it's a parenthesis is what what the term that that commonly is used of, well, we'll get the church out of here so we can have uh, the restoration that we actually wanted. So there's several problems with it. There's several concerns that we have. But tribulation is graphically described in Revelation. And there are three sets of seven. And I'm not going to go through all of those because it's, it's, a, it's like reading a science fiction novel when you read of the tribulation and, and, and Revelation. Because there are, are seven seals, there are seven trumpets, and there are seven bulls. And those are the three sets of tribulation that we find. And, and trying to figure out the order and how things work together, it, it can be either fun or really frustrating, depending on, on how you process those things. But the seals are, we have the, the white horse of, uh, who's the conqueror, the, the, the pale green horse of death. So, so those might be things you're familiar with. Then we get to the trumpets and we find hail and fire. A third of the vegetation is burned. A third of the sea creatures are killed. 
And then we get to the, the, the bowls and we have swords. The sea becomes blood. All marine life dies. The Euphrates River dries up and the kings assemble for war, getting ready for the Armageddon, the last battle. But what, let me remind you of my point that I'm trying to get at is don't panic from the signs. Trust the promise. And, and when you're reading the book of Revelation... It's a, a very difficult and challenging book on many levels. But I came across this, uh, this book called Reading Revelation Responsibly by Michael Gorman. And, and, and it's a really, really interesting book. And, and he, he, he makes several claims about how we need to read the book of Revelation in order for us to interpret what's actually happening here. And he starts by saying that Revelation is not about the Antichrist, it's about the living Christ. And I think that's a distinction we need to make sure we keep in the forefront of our mind. That whatever we're doing, whatever we're talking about, it's about Jesus, it's not about the world. It's about Jesus, not about the problems that we are having. So when we talk about the end times, we always have to keep it focused, it's about Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about what I'm going to experience or what I might be able to avoid. It's about Jesus. Everything has to start there. But also recognizes that what's the point of biblical prophecy? Because the point of biblical prophecy is not to provide an exhaustive and clear roadmap for us to put a puzzle together so we can decode it. That's not the point of biblical prophecy. Biblical prophecy is to either challenge and or comfort God's people. To say, hey, you need to change, or hey, God is going to help you here, or both. That is the point of biblical prophecy. It's not just to say, here's a puzzle that you can decode. That we have to make sure we, we don't view prophecy in that way. But the book of Revelation, in general, is a critique of the imperial or, imperial or secular society. And he uses the term civil religion. And, and in, for the most part, Revelation is rebuking Rome. It's against Rome. It uses the concept of Babylon more than Rome. But it's rebuking the imperial powers of this world. That's not necessarily the government, but it includes the government. Now, Rome was blatantly against Christianity. In many ways, they persecuted Christianity. I think one of the problems that we face in our society is that our country is not blatantly against Christianity in the same way that Rome was against Christianity. But our country is not the church. It's not a religious organization. It's not Jesus. And so on a lot of ways we have to recognize the United States of America is pagan, but it's covered in Christian veneer. So that can be dangerous. That can make us get comfortable as a sheep in wolves' clothing, per se. But John, you remember, who wrote the book of Revelation, is in exile on Patmos. And he is there because he claimed Jesus is Lord and no one else. You read the um, Revelation 2 and 3, you see the seven letters to the seven churches. And a lot of the problem is that they no longer are saying Jesus is Lord and no one else. They are compromising. They are going down this path of saying, well, we're going to make exceptions so that we can get ahead or we can be comfortable. See, when Revelation is viewed as a predictive text that we can decode, it becomes real political real fast. A lot of our politicians use end time speak or terminology that we talk about with end times to get votes. And why wouldn't you? If you're a politician, why wouldn't you do that? That's what politicians do. They're trying to get votes. Now, I think most politicians believe they are doing good or trying to do good, but they're getting votes. But we have to be careful when we talk about the end times of being overly speculative because it can push us into a corner to give us implications that are not healthy. And so I can think of, of the Left Behind series. Again, I don't want to be, be a dead horse, but there's some problems that it makes theologically, that it makes philosophically. Of We can read it as a good and compelling story. We can read it in a way that gives us greater closeness to Jesus, but it's not the Bible, and we need to make sure we recognize that. 
Because one of the, p- the problems with this rapture concept theology of escaping this world is it makes us escapists. It says we're trying to leave. Last week I preached on the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He talked about the resurrection. You know, the Apostle Paul was not longing to escape this world. He had a thorn in his flesh that he couldn't get rid of, but he was not longing to escape. He was longing to be resurrected. He was longing to be restored. He was longing to be redeemed. And if we long to escape, then it devalues this world, this physical world. And if we devalue the world, then God isn't making, he isn't restoring, he isn't redeeming from what Satan has corrupted. And with this, if we view the concept of escapism, it it can push us to the point of, you know, conversion is the most important thing so we can get out of here so we don't have to be left behind. And no one wants to be left behind. Next week, I'm going to continue in Matthew chapter 24. Not with all this detail that I'm giving today for um, all the end time stuff. But you have the, you know, two, two workers are in a field. One leaves and one stays. You know, we don't want to be left behind. We have to be careful not to confuse terminology here. Uh, Jesus isn't talking about vanishing and escaping the world. He's talking about being ready or being not ready. And that's not the only goal. We need to make sure we're ready. We need to make sure others are ready. But being ready is not just saying a few words twiddling your thumbs and waiting for Jesus to return. It's about being an active participant in his kingdom here and now. If Jesus has impacted your life, it means that we do things differently now. We just don't wait. And to me, that's the biggest issue. Read Matthew chapter 25. You know, the, the parable of the ten virgins. You know, that the oil, uh, some have enough oil, some don't. But you know what? They all fell asleep. It's not as though they were all sitting up watching. It's not as though they were all all uh, um, predicting accurately what was going to happen, but some were ready and some weren't. It's not about predicting. It's not about, about doing this or that. It's about being ready for Jesus, about being active with him now. Because there's a big difference between getting the date right and being ready. There's a big difference between accurately predicting what is going to happen and being ready. And the Gospel of Matthew is about calling you to be ready. We leave now. We don't wait. We don't get our affairs in order. We leave now. Because Jesus isn't talking about escaping the world. He's talking about redeeming it. Because Jesus came to usher in the kingdom of heaven. He came to restore this world. He came to bring it back to how it was before sin cursed us. For sin brought condemnation on us. Because Jesus is about redemption first, not condemnation. The condemnation only comes when we reject his redemption. But as I think about what Jesus is calling us to, from a discipleship standpoint, avoiding pain is not the primary goal of the follower of Jesus. Avoiding inconvenience. Now, I don't like being inconvenienced any more than the next person. I don't like it when I get behind a slow driver on the road. I don't like it when I make a mistake that causes delay. I don't like those things. But my primary purpose as a follower of Jesus is not just to live a cushy life. And Jesus is not calling us just to avoid difficulties. He's calling us to build his kingdom here and now so we don't panic from the signs, we trust the promise that redemption is coming, that he is coming to restore this world. I've shared a lot of information today. I imagine you have, there may be several thoughts. Some of you may be like, you know, you could have said all that in about three minutes and we would have been good. Some of you may be frustrated saying, well, I believe things that you don't believe and, 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 and might be feel that way. I don't approach this with arrogance. You can believe differently than what I believe today. But you still got to be ready. This is about being ready. Jesus says, here are the signs. Don't panic. Trust me. The promise is coming. We are called to build the kingdom here and now. 
And that, to me, is the salvation issue. That's the crux of the issue of we are living in the last days, Joel chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, talk about the end the in, at the last days, I will pour my spirit out on my people. And, and we are living in those times now. So we have to be vigilant. We can't wait. We have to go now. Don't panic from the signs. Trust the promise. 